before I left the camp, a, a very kindly physical training sergeant, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, uh, took pity on me and he gave me a diet to follow and uh, um, series of exercises, Max Alding exercises. I did all that for six months. I put on three inches on height and three inches on my chest. So I thought, well, I'll have another shot. And I wrote to the ministry, but they said, no, once you've uh, been turned down, you've been turned down forever. So I thought, well, I'd go through the whole process again in the hope that the uh, bureaucracy wouldn't pick it up. And I was lucky that time and ended up at Cranwell in number four wing. Whittle didn't enjoy life as an RAF apprentice, a rank which offered no chance to fly. But he found his niche in the Model Aircraft Society, building working replicas. His plane-making skills singled him out to the authorities. But there was another reason why his commanding officer thought Whittle might be officer material. He thought that he'd got a, a mathematical genius. Less than 1% of apprentices became officers, but Whittle made this huge step. The officers' training college at Cramwell was next to the apprentices' wing, but socially a world apart. It shared the ethos of the public schools from where most of its cadets had come. It was an intensive education for Whittle, but it did include flying lessons. I learned to fly on the Avro 504K. That was a, a, a very ancient type of aeroplane, 1911 type. The sort with a toothpick between the wheels, you know, to prevent it tipping over on its nose, which in reality, it helps it to tip it over on its nose, <laughs> or even turn upside down. Whittle soon became a daring, if overconfident pilot, and one who had his fair share of accidents. He used to fly upside down over the housing, all against the regulations, of course. Oh, they thought he was marvellous at it, although he nearly frightened my mother to death flying upside down. Nearly dropped a sandbag out of an aircraft once, which was ballasting the aircraft, you know, in the rear seat. And uh, nearly gave a heart attack, I think, at the time. Between flying and the Cranwell course, Whittle conceived the idea that would make him famous. It started with a student thesis. All cadets had to write a thesis, and um, I chose future developments in aircraft design, rather ambitious, and rather concentrated on the engine side. But the main thing in that thesis was that uh, I arrived at what I now know, know was the well-known Breguet formula, that I wasn't familiar with it at the time, connecting speed, range, engine efficiency, and so forth. And to me, that meant that if you wanted to go very fast and far, you would have to go very high, at heights of 50,000 feet, that sort of thing, at heights where the piston engine obviously wouldn't work, and at speeds which the pre pre uh, where the propeller wouldn't work. So it was, I started to look for a new kind of power plant. The propeller planes of the day could only fly at 150 miles an hour. They were noisy and shook the pilot badly. That's because their engines were simply car motors on a bigger scale, with many moving parts. Whittle felt an ascetic dislike for these machines. The problem with the piston engine as you go up height, even though you supercharge it, is that the power drops off as the air gets thinner, and there eventually comes a point where it, it won't generate enough power to turn itself over against its own friction. Whittle's idea was based on the same principle as a balloon filled with air. When this escapes, we all know what happens. Well, it didn't come to me out of the blue for the simple reason that I've been trying to find it for 18 months. But just the, the thought, you might say that came out of the blue. But how could an engine recreate this force? I considered a piston engine driving a fan inside a hollow fuselage, and then thought, well, why not throw that piston engine away, up the compression ratio of the fan, and substitute a turbine for the piston engine? And there was the turbojet. 
Whittle's plan proposed only a single moving part. This would be a shaft with a compressor, driven by a turbine at the other end. It would work like this. The compressor spins round, sucking air into combustion chambers at four times atmospheric pressure. Here, this air is mixed with vaporized fuel and ignited. The hot gas created expands through the turbine, turning the shaft, and escapes into the atmosphere. It is this continuous force which propels a jet aeroplane along. After the idea had come to me, I thought, oh my goodness, why didn't I think of this before? And it seemed so obvious then. That was the moment of genius. Whittle was a pilot officer aged just 21. I was at the Central Flying School at Wittering uh, doing the flying instructors course. One of the instructors there was W.E.P. Johnson, who became a very good friend and colleague in later years, and he'd been trained as a patent agent. And he became very in interested in my proposal. He thought it would work, and he helped me to draft a patent. Have you ever patented anything? No, I don't know a thing about it. Does a patent both publish and protect? That is the whole point of patents. But one thing's essential. File a patent application before touting the thing round. Otherwise, you haven't a hope. I'll tell you what, let's rough out a specification now. Oh, what? Fine, what do we do? Well, you make a rather better sketch, and I'll get on with the clever bit, the writing. OK. Would this dream fade forgotten too? Or might it usher in a revolution in technology. Eventually it would, but there were huge obstacles. According to the theories of the time, there was this fundamental difficulty with gas turbines, inefficient compressors, inefficient turbines, and the other big snag was the materials then existing in 1929 wouldn't stand temperatures of more than, say, about 500 degrees centigrade. But I knew, or felt pretty confident, that they would evolve in the normal course of development. And of course they did. Full of enthusiasm, this positive young officer went to the Air Ministry to propose his revolutionary idea to one of its top scientists, A. A. Griffith. Well, I explained it. And uh, uh, Griffith uh, pointed out an error in my calculations. And it was all rather depressing, you know. And then after that, I got a letter from the Air Minister saying, in effect, that uh, they weren't really interested and so forth. Despite this blow, Whittle continued to develop his idea and his flying skills. He was one of the RAF's best pilots and took part in the Hendon Air Pageants, thrilling the public with his skills at crazy flying. These were the red arrows of their day. The Air Force decided to invest further in Whittle's education. So, in 1934, he went to Cambridge University. Without a degree, Whittle had lacked credibility as an inventor. Now, he could put that right. One of his friends at Cambridge was Arnold Hall. Right, Arnold. Your first visit in 1936. Since birth. Well, no, I've been, of course, to the college since then and looked at the place, but I've never been in the room before. No, I think. It's uh, almost there. Yeah. You are, Sir Arnold. By 12, oh, 1933. Thank you. Thank you. I should well, imagine it brings back some memories. Me, it looks just the same. Not quite. We used to have a cold coal fire there. Indeed, yes. yes much more comfortable. Yeah. I'll leave you to it, Sir Arnold. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Different outlook, too outside. I used to have this room a little differently. The table was over there and the settee was here. But otherwise there's no change. <laughs> I was very surprised one day when I was doing no harm to anyone in this room. There was a heavy knock on the door and I opened it and there was this Royal Air Force officer uh, with a pile of drawings under his uh, arm and he aggressively said, do you know anything about grass turbines? And I was an honest man in those days. I said, no, not a thing. He said, well, I want to show you something. Yeah, and I will remember 
covered the table with sketches and drawings of all sorts, and, and there it was, and explained to me the essence of, of his invention. And uh, he said, well, you see, everyone's against this. Nobody thinks it'll work. Uh, he added, I'm quite sure it will. And uh, I feel I want a pal or two around that I can talk to about who might be interested in it. And that's how our friendship started. It was uh, extraordinary to watch him absorbing the Cambridge ed education, particularly in, in engineering, and moving every piece of learning he got in that department straight onto his jet engine. I had got the feeling, rather, that I might, might be ahead of my time. Um, with the extra knowledge I gained at Cambridge, I did become a, rather more aware of the difficulties. Whittle himself had some visitors at Cambridge, two former Air Force officers who knew about his idea. They had since become entrepreneurs. And they approached me with the idea of forming a company and getting on with it, and they succeeded. They managed to find um, a firm of investment bankers called O.T. Falcon Partners. And in March 1936, they formed the company called Power Jets Limited. I was very much wanted first-class honours, so I had to work like hell because I was designing the jet engine and uh, preparing for my finals at the same time. And that was a very difficult thing to do. I succeeded in getting my first, happily, and uh, then was able to uh, turn back to the jet engine. Whittle turned to a firm in rugby to build the world's first jet engine. British Thomson Houston was a manufacturer of steam turbines. But Whittle only had 2,000 pounds with which to tempt them. His object of going to BTH was to see if they, who were steam turbine manufacturers, would make his engine as, as drawn by him at that time for this money. And um, we went down the road from Cambridge to Rugby with Frank rehearsing all the things he had to say to the steam turbine people and turning round to the passengers in the back to emphasise his points. Uh, a terrifying journey, but we managed to survive and got there. The BTH built the engine. I stood over it, more or less, while it was going on. I felt that we were going to be all right as far as the simple centrifugal compressor was concerned. I felt that I, the turbine was going to be all right, but I was uneasy about the combustion problem because we were aiming at 24 times the kind of in combustion intensity that was um, obtainable in those days. But the engine became ready for running proper on April the 12th of 1937. A lot of people said it wouldn't even turn itself over. What did happen proved the very opposite. I gave a signal with my hands to raise the speed with the electric motor to 2,000 RPM and that was done. And then I opened the main control and it, it started to go away. It accelerated out of control, and so did everyone standing around it. They all went down the factory like the wind. I didn't, because I was petrified with fright. I just couldn't move. It seemed like perpetual motion, but uh, of course it wasn't. The fact was that a pool of fuel had accumulated in the combustion chamber, which we didn't know about, and that was keeping it running after I switched off the control. Well, that sort of thing happened day after day. We had about four of that kind of runaway. Just after the engine first ran and we'd submitted a report to the Air Ministry, this was the subject of a, another report by Griffith, the man who turned the job down in the early days, and his report damned it with faint praise. Uh, he brought in all the difficulties, said that no propeller meant that we wouldn't have the slipstream to help us take off and so forth. During these years, one of Britain's top technical civil servants was Lord Kings Norton. 
Well, this is what we call the main collection room. And really, the collection is in three parts. We have, of course, all the pictures you've seen, which are prints and drawings. He was Whittle's champion during the war and recalls how mistaken was ministry policy towards the engine. You have to remember that high authority in government then was not technologically educated. Probably you could make the same criticism today. Whittle's original ideas were encompassed in his master patent of January 1930, in which uh, a cross-section of the engine, of an engine, was clearly demonstrated. Um, that was not a, a secret patent. There was nobody in the Air Ministry who had the sense to um, make it one. And that and subsequent um, additional patents were all known to the Germans, who took it up uh, avidly while our Air Ministry were refusing to um, put any money into it at all. And that is why the very first flight of a jet-propelled aeroplane uh, was the Heinkel with the, an engine designed by von Ohain. It was not a very good job. Yet Britain knew nothing about Germany's jet programme. On the eve of war, Whittle's position at power jets was precarious. But the potential of his engine was beginning to dawn on people. The aeronautics department here was closed down because of the Im impending likelihood of, of war. And I was asked to go to Farnborough to um, help build a wind tunnel. Now this wind tunnel was a, became a rather special project. It was to w work at 600 miles an hour at that time an unknown speed. And it really represented a change of view of the authorities about the Whittle engine. On June the 30th of 1939, we managed to get a big breakthrough in the attitude of the Air Ministry in that Pai, Director of Scientific Research, uh, came up to see the engine run and we managed to keep it going for about 20 minutes in his presence and he became a complete convert. So much so that he, he agreed that uh, an engine for flight should be ordered and that an aeroplane to use it should be ordered too. This, of course, was the big turning point in the whole job. When it was recognised that the Whittle engine might have a very profound effect on warfare, it had to be accelerated because there was a war on, and in the war you accelerated anything that would help. By now, Whittle had been forced to move from Rugby to an old foundry at nearby Lutterworth. Ladywood Works was the name of the site. Today, there's nothing to show that history was once made here. In 1940, Betty Lawton joined Power Jets as a secretary. Surprise, really, it's still standing. As such as they are, these were the original buildings, the only offices, really, that were available at the time. When Sir Frank came over from BTH at Rugby, there's the main entrance, and then these were whatever offices there were. And then Sir Frank had the office in the corner. And that's where he used to, in between times, when he was contemplating different things, he'd open the window and shoot a few rabbits. <laughs> it's rather dilapidated, doesn't it, I'm afraid? But we had some happy times here. In 1939, we only had uh, uh, just a handful of, of about half a dozen. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and then beginning of 1940, we began to build up a team. And I was very careful in picking uh, real quality. You know, first class honours Cambridge, first class honours Oxford, Imperial College of Science. One of the bright young engineers Whittle recruited was Geoffrey Bone, then a reserve technical officer in the RAF. Well, he was a, an interesting and decisive little man sitting behind a desk and uh, um, his first uh, remark to me was, well, thank God they've sent somebody in uniform because I can now 
order you what to do instead of asking some of these civilians. To me, he came across as somebody with a very high intellect. Another recruit was Bob Fielden. We only had rudimentary resources. I remember, for example, we were given, all given a weekend off while uh, a brave man wearing a respirator got up on ladders and blew off the foundry sand from the rafters uh, of our workshop because this sand kept on blowing down and uh, falling on precision pieces of uh, equipment. It was uh, not a favourable situation at all. When I first uh, arrived, I was put more or less straight away onto combustion testing and combustion development because the problem at the time was how to burn the necessary vast quantities of paraffin in the small space of the 10 combustion chambers. And uh, the fuel didn't burn adequately and produced vast quantities of smelly gases called aldehydes. And we were used to work in conditions of this ladywood works um, very often with our feet soaked in paraffin and our clothes and uniform soaked in paraffin. It was just all hours that the good Lord sent, including weekends and so on. And this meant that uh, uh, any of us who had girlfriends, they had to rather neglect them. Or those who hadn't, hadn't time to find them. Lack of space forced Whittle himself to work at Brownsover Hall, a country house nearby. All Mrs. Bounton Lee's furniture was just pushed to the wall and two desks were put in. It wasn't all carpeted like this. We didn't have central heating. It was quite cold, just had an open fire. It's a lovely room, a lovely setting. It's very peaceful for him, for his work, you know, when you think. I mean, he wouldn't have had that peace at lot of us, with the engines running. Oh, well, Sir Frank was great. I mean, I used to work in the next office. And when he opened the door there, framed with his uniform, very smart gentleman, a very unassuming sort of person, very kind. Nobody could have had a nicer boss. He was the father figure for everybody. I mean, his enthusiasm rubbed off onto everyone else. He did work and worked and worked. I mean, he was a workaholic. It, it, it did affect his health, yes, definitely. In addition to our continuing financial problems, we had many others, including one string of engineering problems, like having to use the same parts over and over again when they ought to have been scrapped. And of course that was linked with the finance because we couldn't afford new parts. We had to make do and furbish up damaged parts. By May 1941, a custom-built plane had been made by Gloucesters for the power jet's engine. The top-secret aircraft was taken to Cranwell for its maiden flight. The power jet's team went up to Cranwell, full of hope. Today, Geoffrey Bone is one of the few surviving witnesses of the occasion. All it needed was good weather for the test pilot, Jerry Sayer. Well, we thought that Jerry Sayers was probably just going to do another taxi trial, as he had been doing on some previous runs. But I think we all hoped that as the weather had cleared a bit, that uh, this might be more than just uh, uh, the previous short run, and so it turned out to be. Jerry Sayer was sitting at the end of the runway, and party of us was sitting just to the right, and he held it on the brakes and ran out the engine to full speed, released his brakes, and then he, he hopped off in about 600 yards. Quite an impressive takeoff. Then he held it down level and then climbed. The feeling of surprise coupled with elation when we saw that he was not in fact pulling up at the end of the airfield but was going, going on uh, up into the sky was uh, 
Well, it was quite, quite amazing, really. One of my colleagues, Pat Johnson, W.E.P. Johnson, slapped me on the back. He said, Frank, it flies. And in the tension of the moment, I rather rudely said, that was bloody well what it was designed to do, isn't it? Mm. I can remember the fact that there was a, quite a lot of blue sky in stripes that evening, and he disappeared into cloud. And the new whistling noise of the 2839 ushered in a new sound in the sky, and you could always hear the continuing of this whistling sound. And the amazing feeling one had, almost a surreal feeling, and he sailed back and landed perfectly. Somebody somewhere, I can't tell you who it was, produced a bottle of champagne. It's the first time I'd ever had any. And we all sort of celebrated, probably not out of glasses, probably cups, but at least we did it. Oh, there was great hilarity, as you can imagine, when, it, when word got back that it had flown. We had a party, of course, but it had to be a very subdued party because on the one hand, the people who were in the know were um, quite fired up, um, but we couldn't uh, let the rest of the uh, officers who were mulling around in the mess uh, into, into the secret. People in the area hadn't heard that uh, particular kind of noise before, and you couldn't really hide it, however secret it was supposed to be. Uh, one officer was said to have asked another one, how does that thing work, John? And John replied, oh, it's easy, old boy, it just sucks itself along like a hoover. Whittle had a terrific fight uh, all that time to get this kind of recognition, but the flight made all the difference. It was a manifest success. Whittle's engine and the strange new plane with no propeller were clearly where the future lay. Britain's engine makers wanted to be part of it. There was a great interest, and one of the outcomes was my idea of creating uh, a, for, a more or less formal way in which the interested in parts of the um, uh, aircraft engine industry uh, could uh, collaborate. So we formed the Gas Turbine Collaboration Committee and I was chairman of it. All this, of course, is putting power jets into a weaker and weaker position from the commercial point of view. But then we, and that we had to uh, swallow because it was a wartime situation. And I and several other, several other uh, of my team were serving officers. And uh, we had to put uh, national considerations before commercial considerations. That was very dominant in my mind. British industry itself was working flat out building engines for warplanes like the Spitfire and Hurricane. So, in 1941, the country turned to America for help in building Whittle's engine, giving away the secret in the process. Churchill and Roosevelt knew that America had got to come in in the end and wanted to be ready for the day. And what is more, we wanted to be sure that we could have a satisfactory production even though we were being bombed to the Dickens ourselves. And so there was every reason for getting American manufacturing um, behind us, even if they'd never come in uh, to the war. We shipped over the um, engine in parts in, in the Bombay of a Liberator, and also with the team, who were, in, who were horribly frightened lest the pilot should pull the wrong uh, lever and they'd all drop into the Atlantic. For America, the jet story began the night of October 4th, 1941, with the arrival of a highly secret engine assembly at a Boston airport. It was Britain's now famous Whittle turbojet, the first jet engine successfully produced and flown by the Allies. Gentlemen, I give you the Whittle engine. Consult all you wish and arrive at any decision you please, just as long as you accept a contract to build 15 of them. They had that engine, their engine, version of the W-2B, 
called the Type I, on test in April of 42, so just rather less than six months, which is astonishing. And uh, even better than that, uh, six months later, the Bell Aircraft Company had their twin-engine jet flying. Whittle himself went over to America to advise with building the engines for this plane. It was most satisfying to see the work GE were doing because, uh, well, they got on with the job so fast. It was uh, remarkable. And their enthusiasm was most inspiring. And I thought at the time, if only I had had that kind of cooperation a few years earlier, what a difference it would have made. This is a meteor, and the meteor was, of course, the main focus of effort in the 1940s in the endeavor to get a fighter aircraft into the air for usable by the RAF ahead of the Germans. The Air Force eagerly awaited this new plane, but power jets was denied the means to mass produce its engines. The job had been given to Rover, the car maker. We intended that the uh, Rover company should be uh, subcontractors and only subcontractors, but unfortunately they went behind our back to the ministry and, and tried to get direct contracts and eventually they succeeded in doing that. And instead of being subcontractors to us, they in effect became competitors who had the advantage of having all our information handed to them on the orders of the ministry. Rover also made design changes to the Meteor's engines, which greatly delayed their production. The problem was only solved when Rover was told to give the job to Rolls-Royce, with its vast expertise in aero engines. But this would only weaken power jets further. Ernest Hayes was the chief executive of Rolls-Royce, and he was responsible for the Rolls-Royce part in taking over the jet development. Of course, he, he had come to realize that this was the future of the aero engine. And since Rolls-Royce then were uh, one of the most pro prominent aero engine firms in the world, he wasn't going to be left out. He was a, I would call him an honest rogue, because when he was going to do the dirt, he told you he was in advance. And one of the things he said to me on one occasion was, we're going to be the center of this job and nothing you can do will stop us. You must realize that all these companies who uh, took up the work, notably Rolls-Royce, they all admired Whittle and his work enormously. But they had policies for their own companies which ran rather counter to what Whittle would have wanted for his company. One can't uh, criticize them adversely. It's just, I'm afraid, uh, the way of things. <laughs> With Rolls-Royce engines, the Meteor first flew in 1943. The work of Frank Whittle, at last, had a bearing on the outcome of the war. We had been working in complete secrecy until early January 1944, at which time, for reasons I don't really know, um, the British and American governments decided to uh, make an announcement about it. <laughs> it was like the world blew up around me. The shock was very considerable. The press descended on the Whittle household. He wasn't allowed to tell Mother what he was doing. And I think she really felt rather offended by that. So there was a sort of an atmosphere in it. She says he has had time for nothing but his job. I got fed up about it sometimes. What woman wouldn't? But I knew how important it was, so I didn't grumble. Well, that's right. She was a good support to him. You know, they parted company in 1951, but um, there was never any acrimony between them. It was a cold day in January when this first appeared in the newspaper. Of course, what's, what's interesting about this is how the journalists had quite a problem as to what headlines they were going to put on it. 
the first thing is a fighter with no propeller. And then they say driven by hot air. I think a lot of people wondered where on earth the hot air was coming from. Um, and it's, it's delightful. They say all tests passed. Well, one can only uh, wish that that had in fact been the case. Adulated by the press, it seemed Whittle was at his peak. Power jets by now had a factory where engines could be made in volume. Whittle had a clear vision for his company. No one except power jets had risked any money, except the, the government, of course. And I felt that uh, the government having put in two million, that uh, all the companies should be nationalized forming a collective turbojet establishment. And, of course, I hoped that power jets would be the, uh, at the top of the pyramid with myself as chief engineer. But only power jets was nationalized. And to Whittle's dismay, he was then told it could not make engines in competition with private industry. So we, the people who had pioneered the whole thing, were deprived of the right to design and build engines. Needless to say, he was disappointed. And I think from the point of view of uh, an RAF officer, he had regarded power jets to some extent as an operational command. And it's, as it were, he had this operational command taken off him. I tried to help him. I thought he could have been the head of a bigger organization building engines. But, um, in the high parts of the government, this was felt not the right idea. Whittle's fame meant a busy life giving lectures here and abroad, but in his mind were visions for the jet engines of the next 20 years. And yet his former rivals never hired him. I know there were talks between Hives and Whittle which Hives had, in which Hives had the idea of bringing Whittle into the Rolls-Royce ambit and team, but they didn't quite agree. I, I think I'd put it that I was sorry rather than surprised. <laughs> Frank Whittle, very determined, very talented man, but he was essentially someone who wanted to get on and do things. He, he was single-minded. That sort of person, of course, and particularly in a post-war situation, um, can be regarded as rather a nuisance, put it that way. Whittle's stature made him hard to place in an industry which he had founded himself. But Britain soon thanked him with a knighthood. He was also rewarded financially. Was this really enough for founding such a huge industry? Well, I'm quite sure it wasn't. I think that in light of what has happened, of course, as a result of Whittle's work, you could see that he was much under-rewarded in, uh, in that way, if you want to put it in money terms. I remember particularly uh, the way he was uh, so very loyal to all his staff. And uh, when he had his first award, he called several of us into his office one by one and uh, asked us about our personal situations and then wrote out cheques to us, uh, giving us uh, part of the award, which was extremely generous of him. Whittle's loyalty to his staff inspired their lifelong devotion. But they moved on, and he left the Air Force he loved so much. He had time on his hands to travel and to try to recuperate. In many ways, I paid quite heavily for um the work I did, there was the awful race against time. That dominated life. On top of all the technical difficulties, there were the financial difficulties, there was the skullduggery of uh, uh, people who were uh, messing things up, and uh, oh, it was frustration after frustration, and it took its toll. I began to have a series of nervous breakdowns. And for years, it was years before I really recovered my health. So the jet age began without Whittle. Britain launched the world's first jet airliner, the Comet, in 1949. The plane was a fruition of all Whittle's dreams. Jets also powered British nuclear bombers. 
but the nation couldn't afford such planes. They became museum pieces. It was an American model, Boeing 707, which brought long-range jet travel to the masses. Soon, airlines were mostly buying planes from America. And in the 70s, Whittle himself went to live there. Well, he always said that he felt he got more recognition there. And uh, it is, of course, uh, a much more open society uh, than uh, the somewhat class-risen society in Britain is. And uh, he just felt at home there. He loved their attitude. So gung-ho and, and keen and, and always willing to praise you for something you did well. Whereas here, there was always an embarrassment and... Um, in the mid-80s, Britain again remembered its genius of the jet. The Queen awarded him the Order of Merit. Oh, he was uh, very, very distinctly uh, happy about it. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, he, he always felt a little bit that the uh, British were a little late in, in recognising what he'd managed to achieve. His legacy, of course, is profound. People can travel cheaply and safely very long distances. What are the political results of that? They are enormous. The races are intermingled. Distances which made contact almost impossible are now possible in a few hours. You've only to stand in the middle of Heathrow and see what is happening there to realize that this has totally changed the lives of people. Whittle's work also has a special legacy for Britain. The famous plane makers have gone, but Rolls-Royce still leads the world in building jet engines. I can only say it's extremely satisfying, especially when you see something like the Concorde. And one of the things you see I never foresaw when I was working on this thing is that I would be a passenger crossing the Atlantic in three and a half hours. Now, incidentally, another thing I didn't foresee is that I would have a son who would be flying 747s as a captain.